Hello and welcome to the Center for Values first virtual book launch event. My name is Magdalena Groman and I am Associate Director at the Center for Values. Today we are launching an important and timely book written by my dear colleague Matthew Brown or Matt Brown uh, as he's known to at least some of us. The book is on science and moral imagination, a new ideal for values and in science. For those who joined us live today, we have a link to the free download of the book in the chat. And for those who will watch the event on YouTube, the link is included in the description of the recording. Let me now introduce our author, Matt Brown, and our moderator, Kevin Elliott. Matt Brown is the director of the Center for Values in Medicine, Science and Technology. He's also program head of history and philosophy and professor of philosophy and history of ideas at the University of Texas at Dallas. He works in philosophy of science, science and technology studies and cognitive science. The main, the main areas of his research deal with the intersection of science, with values, the way science informs policy and the history of American pragmatism. He has recently published his book on these issues, and we are here to celebrate this book, Science and Moral Imagination, A New Ideal for Values in Science. The book has been recently published by the University of Pittsburgh Press. And, and on to our moderator, Dr. Kevin Elliott. Kevin is a professor of philosophy with joint appointments across several units at Michigan State University. His scholarship operates at the intersection of the philosophy of science, research ethics and environmental ethics, with a focus on the roles that ethical and social values play in research on environmental pollution. He's the author or editor of several books on these issues, including Is a Little Pollution Good For You? as well as a recent A Tapestry of Values, an Introduction to Values in Science. Both books have been published by Oxford University Press. Kevin will give a short overview of the book's main argument, and shortly after that, our author Matt Brown will read a couple of excerpts from the book, followed by a Q&A and discussion moderated by Kevin. Let me now turn to our moderator to summarize the main argument of the book for our audience. Kevin? It's a pleasure to be able to, to be part of this. Um, it, it really is a, a privilege to be able to celebrate Matt's new book. Um, I've always really enjoyed um, engaging with him. And um, I guess it's an indication of uh, how highly I think of him that, you know, it, I feel like almost all my projects, you know, edited, you know, books, special issues and so on, they almost all have some contribution from Matt in them because I really appreciate his work. And so it's a treat to be able to um, play this role today. And um, so I was asked to go ahead and give kind of an opinionated introduction to his book. So I'll throw in a little commentary of my own um, as I just kind of give the broad outlines as I see it. And the good thing is you've got Matt here to correct anything um, crazy, I say. So I, I like the fact that he starts off the preface of the book with this um, 2017 statement from the AAAS, um, the statement on scientific freedom and responsibility. So the statement, you know, begins by stating, you know, a view of scientific freedom, but then it says that this freedom is inextricably linked to and must be exercised in accordance with scientific responsibility. And then it says scientific responsibility is the duty to conduct and apply science with integrity in the interest of humanity and a spirit of stewardship for the environment and with respect for human rights. And so I think Matt nicely um, sets things up, noting that that's sort of at the start of what he's trying to do. He wants to explore in the book how far do the responsibilities of science to society extend and how can scientists who are experts in technical matters, but not in ethics or values, fulfill their responsibilities. And I think that's what Matt is really trying to do in this book, as he states in the preface. And so I kind of think of the book as having sort of a three part structure. So first, he offers what he calls a contingency argument against the value free ideal for science. And then 
he offers a pragmatist theory of values and value judgments that clarifies how we're able to kind of avoid a problematic wishful thinking or subjectivity despite abandoning the value-free ideal. And then third, um, at the end of the book, he you know sort of fleshes out an alternative ideal, the ideal of moral imagination, building on this account of values and value judgments, and in which he calls for scientists to implement his moral imagination. So um, let me just say a little bit about these different elements of, of, the, of the argument. So maybe I can start with the contingency argument. And I really like this argument. I think, you know, Matt's clearly building on, you know, previous work in the field, but I think he expresses um, these ideas in a really thoughtful and systematic way that I find to be right on target. Um, so he emphasizes that scientists have to make numerous judgments in the course of their work. This can involve, of course, you know, what they study, the specific questions they decide to ask, the way they go about investigating those questions, their methodologies, um, how they deal with ambiguous evidence, bringing different lines of evidence together, communicating their results. You know, this is stuff that I'm, you know, right on board with. And um, he points out that, you know, with so many of these judgments, evidence and logic and scientific standards don't determine these choices. So there's contingency associated with these choices. And so he emphasizes that scientists have ethical responsibilities to consider the values at play when they're making these choices. And so then he considers the worry that this might clash with our expectations of scientific objectivity or integrity, that this one might worry this brings in a kind of you know, subjectivity or potential for wishful thinking. Um, and he argues that um, you know, by having a, a theory of value according to which our values and value judgments aren't you know, sort of problematically subjective, we can avoid these kinds of worries. And, and this is a point just to kind of, you know, potentially get discussion going later. You know, it's possible that here, you know, Matt and I might see things slightly differently. Not that I would want to see values as entirely, you know, subjective, um, but I think I might um, explore other ways of being able to maintain scientific objectivity or integrity through, um, you know, maintaining an appropriate kind of um, transparency or openness about cases where scientists diverge from typical norms um, by uh, promoting an appropriate engagement among scientists and so on. Yeah. Um, but anyway, there are, I think these are things that we could discuss further. What I really do um, uh, think, like, sorry, my, my son is running into the room here. Um, thank you. <laughs> the excitement of having a, 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 a virtual book launch. Um, what I do think is really important um, is that um, because of Matt's sort of rich account of values and value judgments, um, we're able to really explore um, a thoughtful way of addressing these kinds of judgments. And he has this rich section in the middle part of the book where I think this is something that people are going to see as really new and valuable in this literature, where he discusses value judgment as having a problem-solving structure similar to scientific inquiry itself. And um, so this is where the moral imagination comes in with the consideration in this um, realm of value judgment of the different stakeholders at play, the options, um, the consequences, and the creative solutions um, that they can explore. And so um, he does a very nice job of, um, uh, of exploring different sources of values, whether they be biological or cultural, um, scientific or democratic, this is something that I think we've been missing in a lot of the, the literature, sort of carefully fleshing out, you know, where do these values come from? What are the different kinds? How do we compare enjoyments, wishes, preferences, desires, goals, ideals, value attributes, institutional structures? There are all these kinds of concepts floating around um, related to this notion of values. And I think Matt really helps us in the middle part of the book to, to think about this more carefully. Um, and so then his final chapter, um, uh, I might just pull out a quotation of sort of that I think summarizes his ideal of moral imagination. He says, 
scientists should recognize the contingencies in their work as unforced choices, discover morally salient aspects of the situation they're deciding, and recognize and understand the legitimate stakeholders, imaginatively construct and explore possible options, and exercise fair and warranted value judgment in order to guide those decisions. So he wants you know, scientists to exercise their moral imagination in thinking through these contingent choices that they have to face. And so that's, you know, sort of where things end up at the end. And if I could just throw out a few of the other things I really like about the book um, before I turn it over to Matt. Um, one thing that especially struck me is so often in philosophical literature, you just have a bunch of text. And I think you all really enjoy finding figures and tables, you know, diagrams that um, represents a lot of his ideas. He has a wonderful, very simple quadrant diagram that I recommend to all of you for thinking about actual practical, you know, working with uh, uh, scientists um, and thinking about um, uh, the, the issues at play and decisions where he represents the goal or the task, the values associated with it, the options or alternatives, and the stakeholders. And I think this is just a really nice, elegant way of starting to think about, you know, how to approach these kinds of value judgments. Um, I also love his clear exposition of Dewey. Um, I really like a lot of what Dewey has to say, but I end up getting all confused and bogged down um, actually reading it. And so um, I love reading Matt's exposition of this. So he conceptualizes both scientific practice and value judgment in terms of practical inquiry. And um, so I really recommend um, taking a look at, at that description. And um, he also does a nice job situating at the beginning and the end of the book um, three cases to help us think about the, the value-laden character of scientific inquiry. He has a case study related to scientific racism, a case study related to feminist psychology, and a case study related to stem cell research. So there are all kinds of fun things to explore in this book. Um, but I think I'll go ahead and um, hand it over to Matt and let him maybe read just a little bit from it so you can get a taste of uh, what he's up to. Thank you, Kevin, for that lovely introduction. Um, I really appreciate it. And, and thanks to everyone who's here. It's, it's really lovely to see uh, uh, the folks who've showed up. Um, and so I'm gonna read from the book. Um, I am going to uh, just read a little section from the beginning of the last substantive chapter of the book um, before the conclusion. Um, so there will be some spoilers here um, for, the, uh, for the argument of the book, but um, I think it nicely captures uh, some of the things that you might find interesting. So here we go. Um, this is from chapter six, the ideal of moral imagination. As I have argued previously, ideals are needed to guide action to give it vision and direction beyond the most immediate needs and problems that face us. Ideals are the enduring ends and purposes that guide individuals and communities that give a sense of unified perspective to individuals and associations. They are far from utopian fantasies, at least when they are worthy ideals, because they speak to the needs of the present sufficiently well to guide activity. Insofar as science is a social practice and a vocation, it requires ideals to give it shape, identity, and meaning. We have also seen that scientists have a responsibility to engage in value judgments whose depth is seldom appreciated. Whatever other ideals guide and animate science, such as the scientific values and community norms discussed in chapter four, an additional ideal is needed, one to replace the value-free ideal in light of the arguments in chapter two that showed its failure. In addition, value judgment, in contrast to habitual valuing, centrally involves the moral imagination. But from this account of value judgment, I propose the following new ideal for values in science. And Kevin already read this bit, but um, it's, I think, worth um, uh, saying again. The ideal of moral imagination. Scientists should recognize contingencies in their work as unforced choices, discover morally and epistemically salient aspects of the situation they are deciding, empathetically recognize and understand the legitimate stakeholders and their interests, imaginatively construct and explore possible options, and exercise fair and warranted value judgments in order to guide those decisions. 
The ideal suggests four activities to engage in in order to deliberate about any contingency. Number one, identify the goal or task at hand. Number two, identify and imaginatively multiply options for how to carry out the task. Number three, determine the standards and values that are relevant to the situation. And number four, identify the legitimate stakeholders to consider and identify their interests. Mutual refinement and development of these four areas provide the materials necessary for acting on the ideal of moral imagination. The process will not typically proceed in a linear order. Um, the ideal of moral imagination in turn allows us to recognize new ways of being irresponsible in scientific research. We're already familiar with the problem of scientific misconduct, whether deliberate or not. When scientists violate clear codes or norms of responsible research, such as fabricating data, plagiarism, and performing human subject research without consent. Now we can recognize a second form of irresponsibility, which I call failures of moral imagination. When scientists fail to recognize contingencies or fail to consider superior options where their decision has significant effects on stakeholders or other morally salient aspects. The first kind of irresponsibility, scientific misconduct, is a standard concern in research ethics. Though scientists do not always live up to it, there's nothing particularly controversial about it, except for some disagreements about the details about what the standards are. For example, what exactly counts as informed consent, or what exactly counts as a case of fudging the data. The second kind of irresponsibility is, an, is something new, suggested by the new ideal. It is not an all or nothing matter. For the most part, scientific misconduct either does or does not happen. Perhaps there are borderline cases of plagiarism or informed consent. You know, maybe the boundary is fuzzy, but um, uh, you know, in the main, you either plagiarize or you don't. You get informed consent or you don't. On the other hand, failures of imagination come in degrees. There are extreme cases, but they are notable as extremes with many gradations between them. Someone asked the page numbers I'm reading from, and it's uh, it's the very beginning of chapter six. It starts on 185. Now I'm starting page 188. The main focus of the ideal of moral imagination is not, however, on the negative aspects of irresponsibility on the part of scientists. It is on the positive improvements to science and to society that come from an increase in the exercise of moral imagination. On the one hand, the ethical and social benefits of the ideal of moral imagination arise due to the increased consideration of the values at stake in research activities. On the other hand, there are significant epistemic benefits involved in going through the processes laid out in the ideal of moral imagination, which requires activities central to divergent thinking and creative problem solving. That is, the ideal of moral imagination requires explicit reflection on the nature of the goal or task at hand and on the constraints for adequately fulfilling it, a part of the creative problem solving process known as problem finding. The ideal also requires multiplying options beyond the obvious in hopes of finding solutions that better, better integrate value considerations. Both of these processes create significant epistemic benefits in helping prevent scientists from being stuck in uh, local optima in the space of solutions, we might call them. That is solutions that appear best because too narrow a view of possibilities has been taken where better solutions are available, but beyond the horizon of where we've looked. Consider the case of restrictions on embryonic stem cell research discussed in the introduction. And, and there, you know, I, I rehearsed the, um, uh, the history in the US of funding restrictions on, um, on embryonic stem cell research. Um, whether or not you agree with the value judgment about the status of embryos behind the ban, and I think there are some serious concerns to be raised about the soundness of that judgment, there is no doubt that the landscape of stem cell research was significantly shaped by funding decisions and other types of restrictions, especially in the United States from 2001 to 2009, um, and really going back to 1973, but that's, that's another matter. As a result, scientists dependent on federal funds and interested in stem cell research had to creatively multiply their options, and this led to the development of techni techniques for using non-embryonic stem cells from a multitude of sources. It is almost certainly the case that such research would not have advanced as far as it has without the existence of the ban. That is research on things like adult induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, now one can see this either as a silver lining 
or as a superior result, depending on whether one agrees with the value judgments behind the opposition to research on human embryos. Either way, values and imagination work together to break new ground with distinct benefits that may have been less developed if different values and politics had led research funding decisions in a different direction. Losses and frustrations from one perspective become gains from another. So I'll stop there. Um, that's from the, the chapter six. Um, and uh, yeah, Kevin. Great, thanks so much, Matt. So um, I think what we were envisioning was that I might ask Matt a question or two, just to kind of uh, you know get discussion started, and you all can be contemplating what questions you might have. You can put in the chat, and then in a few minutes we'll open things up. Um, and and again, you can either put questions in the chat or you can raise your hands. Um, uh, but but maybe I'll start things off for five minutes or so with some initial questions. Um, one thing that I thought would be uh, fun to get uh, Matt's thought about is that, you know, one might think that this approach, um, this ideal of moral imagination, puts a lot of pressure on um, individual scientists or perhaps labs of scientists to be using their moral imagination, to be, you know, thinking through stakeholders and options and, and values um, and, and recognizing the contingencies involved in their work. And, you know, one might work, worry that, these scientists may not have the kind of training to really be thinking through all these issues. Um, they might have a bit of, you know, RCR training, something like that. But um, one might wonder if they have enough to really bring them up to speed on all the issues. And one might worry that, you know, um, perhaps their judgments might not be as thoughtful as, you know, say somebody with a lot of experience in thinking through these issues. So um, maybe you could say a few words, Matt, about you know, the extent to which you think the scientists have, you know, what it takes, if you will, to do this well, um, you know, what the pros and cons are of, of this kind of approach versus, you know, one where you're depending a little bit more perhaps on outside experts in, you know, research ethics or, you know, these kinds of social issues um, and, and what role others might play in this process. So maybe you could just say a little bit about um, how you see that playing out. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so, uh, I, I have a few different things to say about this. Um, one is, it's true that the, um, uh, the ideal asks a lot of the individual scientists. And um, I think, you know, it's important to note that it is an ideal, right? It is a, it is meant to be something that uh, scientists should strive for rather than a kind of minimum floor of, um, you know, ethical requirements, right? That's sort of the scientific misconduct realm, right? Um, on the, you know, on the other hand, I, I mean, I do think that uh, if, the, if this ideal is right and, and, it, uh, and we accept it, uh, it does imply some pretty significant um, uh, revisions to how we think about research ethics training, right? And in particular, we, we should expect that there needs to be more of it, right? Um, now, I think the the framework I offer in the book does offer some tools to the scientists to make it um, a little bit easier to do this work, right? Um, but um, but but you know, it's still a burden. I mean, there's still a burden there, right? Um, in some cases, now, so the other thing I would just add to this is, um, you know, there there are some cases in which it, it, Precisely the right thing to do is to get somebody from the outside to help you, right? Um, that may be when it comes to the consideration of stakeholders and their interests, right? Um, that typically is hard to find out without asking, right? Um, without engaging them in some way. Um, and so, you know, I, I do say with respect to sort of um, larger policy relevant issues in a democracy that that should be expected right as part of the process but you can't you can't expect to engage stakeholders in every moment where values are relevant because there's just too many of them right there are too many contingent moments that happen in the everyday practice of science um so it's you know what it you know what following the ideal looks like in particular cases is going to vary a lot context to context and and it often may just like lots of scientific work requires a team to do it well um, when it's complicated enough and involves multiple expertise. 
so too, you know, satisfying the ideal may require a, a team, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll just take the privilege of the moderator to ask one more question, and then I'm already seeing stuff in the chat, and I see that there are people with their hands raised, so I won't take too much more time. But um, one might just sort of following up on on you know my question about the extent to which the scientists themselves can can do this. Um, I think a, a significant. Um, point that's been raised in this literature recently is the need for us to think more uh, about institutional structures. And this is actually something that Heather Douglas um, wisely pointed out in response to my own book that we need to um, really be thinking about the you know, institutional issues. And so I, I also wondered if you wanted to say anything about you know, you do mention in the book that you are focusing more at this individual level, but do you think we can draw lessons from what you have to say for the institutional level, or should we just wait for your next book for you to really address those issues? I think there are, there are a few things we can say about the, the sort of larger social institutional level of science. Um, I mean, I, I think there are some interesting ideas already out there. Um, in the in the book, I acknowledge um, in particular, that that um, Helen Longino's account of social objectivity um, has a lot to offer in thinking about these concepts. Um, maybe also Philip Kitcher's concept of well-ordered science. Um, but I will say, I think, um, you know, there there is a kind. There are a couple of kinds of continuity between the individual level and the institutional level that that we might be able to use some of the ideas from the book to think about institutional level stuff as well. I mean, one of them is um, that institutional change happens as a result of the actions of individuals, right? So, you know, insofar as the exercise of your own moral imagination and your own scientific projects lead you to um, lead you to worry about something that's an institutional factor, right? Um, you know, institutional redesign is is going to be, be a, a matter of of individuals getting together and working together to change things. Um, the other thing, the other thing I would say is, you know, in some in some but not all cases, you can you can treat you can treat a social group as a kind of distributed agent, right? And so you can kind of apply agent level thinking. Also, to group activities, not not all the time, but some of the time, right? And that's a, that's something I do also explicitly talk about in the text, is using sort of distributed cognition ideas uh, to think about group group behavior. Cool, great, thank you, Matt. Well, people are obviously excited about your book. Um, we've got all kinds of comments and questions happening in the chat here, so. Um, I think Rowan really jumped in really early on with a um, question that. Uh, was typed in the chat, but maybe it might be nice to be able to actually um, have the opportunity to speak it. So if we could unmute Rowan, then maybe uh, we can have the verbal Q and A. Great, feel free to go ahead. Yeah. So um, my my comment basically, I find the contingency argument very fan. Like, I think it's great. I find it really persuasive. And you know, as a sociologist who's interested in studying these issues, like sort of empirically. What I find interesting about the contingency argument is that it doesn't actually require any kind of claims about implicit or unconscious values that are acting on scientists and motivating them, right? It's really, it's a, it's a normative claim about the responsibility of scientists to take the practical consequences of what they're doing into account. And so it's not an empirical claim about the influences or motivations on them. And you can contrast that with the practical reason argument, which uh, Kevin didn't talk about, but basically that that is that does basically claim that all action is motivated by values. Usually ex implicit is basically the, the kind of like claim. And my question is basically, why do we need the second argument? And another way to put that, that this question is, do we really need to keep Dewey's functionalism around? Like, do we really need that in order to study values in science? And then a third way to put the question would be, what if we just viewed values in terms of evaluation, in like the role of values and expertise as a uh, linked particularly to deliberative, explicit processes of justification and contestation. So that's the question. Okay, thank you, Rowan. And it's good to see you here. Um, so uh, I would say, you know, it is my intention that um, the contingency argument itself be independent of the pragmatist or functionalist commitments 
of the of the book, right? So um, I do think that um, I do think that the 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 views in chapter one, the sort of the sort of pragmat pragmatist image of science in chapter one, um, and uh, you know, plus the contingency argument, more or less. Um, uh, Okay, well, that's not how I want to put it. What I want to say is, um, if you accept the pragmatist image of science in chapter one, I think the the practical reason argument um, uh, gives you the um, gives you a stronger reason to accept values in science even than the contingency argument. But unlike the contingency argument, it does depend on uh, accepting that that sort of pragmatist framework. Um, so I think we could we could do a lot of the work in the book um, without it, without that second argument, but we don't get the nice sort of um, parallel between scientific inquiry and value judgment, and we don't get um, we don't really get the sort of deflection of the worries about objectivity um, that that parallel brings with it. So I, I would, you know, I would say if you if you hate that stuff, you can kind of cut it out, and the rest of the the rest of the work um, stands, in my view. Um, but uh, I think it does. They are sort of mutually reinforcing in some respects. Thanks. It's a good it's a good question, Ron. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, so I think that also um, Catherine Wilmack, which is great to see you. You uh, posted a question in the chat. Would you like to go ahead and, and verbalize it? Um, if I can mute her. Hi. Let's see. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to. Can you see me? No. Uh, start video. But we can hear you. Um, okay. <laughs> Actually, I was really responding to a comment that. Uh, Deepan Wida um, had mentioned about um, STEM education, and I'll just say briefly, and then maybe she wants to chime in, that in looking at issues about value judgments and moral imagination, uh, she had said, well, how do we incorporate in this into STEM education? Um, at my university, we got an NSF grant to do STEM um, enrichment, and um, we developed a I developed a science and values course, um, and the students took it as sophomores. And it was very surprising to me how unfamiliar they were um, with this kind of deliberative um, reasoning. But it turns out uh, with exit interviews um, as graduating seniors, they all got it. <laughs> um, so they also took a sociology of science course. And they actually listed those two courses as their most important ones, the ones who were going to grad school. Um, um, so, so um, at, Kevin, you had mentioned earlier that there is this issue which worries me about the training of scientists. And on the one hand, maybe this is a call to assign, we all think that, that a philosopher of science should be assigned to every single scientific research group. Um, um, but uh, but sort of expanding scientific training to include this seems like a good idea. Uh, Deepan Wida, did you want to add? Um, thank you, Dr. Romak. I think I managed to unmute myself. Yeah. Uh, Matt, thank you on the book, on the very nice talk. I probably missed the first two minutes of it, but um, I want to give a little bit of background to my question. So since 2016, Myself and another of my colleague in philosophy, we teach these research ethics courses to groups of chemistry students. It is a select program of very talented minority students. And um, the director of the program thought that ethics should be dealt by philosophers themselves, the group of people who developed ethical thinking. And we found the same kind of thing problem that you found in uh, probably in your development of the course that the students are very unfamiliar with the idea. Um, not only that, uh, to them, the world of science is a world of facts. You just find the right answer, right protocol and right uh, way to do things. And you go ahead and execute it. So it is a matter of skill. There is nothing to think, there is nothing to be worried about. But it turns out 
that people do like it, students do like it. Faculty on the whole remain hesitant about it. They do see um, engaging in philosophical question as a kind of waste of time, waste of their very valuable and very um, limited time. So after four years of doing this, man, I have an idea. Is it possible to create a group of polymaths? Not specialized scientists like we do today, not specialized philosophers of science or philosophers of language as we do today, but a kind of descendant of the natural philosophers 300 years back. Is it possible to create a kind of polymaths once again? Who will be the bearer of moral imagination? And those polymaths could become part of the research groups and they supply, they, they will be a kind of capillary exchange between the philosophers and the scientists. So um, thank you both, Catherine and Deepan Wida. I, I, uh, it's really good, good to see you here and really engaging um, questions. I'll just, I'll say here a couple of things. Um, I do talk about in the conclusion of the book, using the framework in educational contexts and specifically in research ethics or responsible conduct of research training. Um, but I think what I say there is also applicable to undergraduate education. Um, so there's a, um, there's a, let me see if I can show you this. Um, there is a worksheet in the um, back of the book. Uh, which you can copy, or you can go to the website for the book and um, print it out. Uh, print it out as a PDF of it there. Okay, I can't get it up. Anyway, it goes through those four steps I talked about when I did my reading: the the goal, the options, the values, and the stakeholders. And um, there's a description of how, by consider sort of um, iterative consideration of all of those factors in relation to one another, in trying to multiply options and integrate values, you can arrive at um, better value judgments. Um, so I do think that's possible. Um, I don't, I, I also, I just, I'll also point out uh, also in the conclusion of the book, I do, I do say um, with respect to um, uh, these particularly difficult kinds of, of questions where it's too much burden on the scientists and by themselves to do the work, um, I say on page 228 of the book, clearly the best solution to this problem would be for every laboratory to employ philosophers of science full time for the express purpose of raising awareness about contingency um, uh, and, and value judgment. Um, maybe that's a little tongue in cheek, of course, but uh, there it is. I don't know about polymaths. I mean, I'm certainly, um, I certainly find some things about that view attractive. Um, Deep in Wida, but I'm, I guess, more inclined to think that there's little chance of, of turning back the clock on the cognitive division of labor. And what we, what we need to do is, on the one hand, um, better train scientists to engage on this, uh, in this on, on their own, and then train philosophers of science who can act as kind of, um, uh, who, to, train philosophers of science to better engage with the scientists so that they can engage in a kind of cooperative activity. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you so much. So I think um, Adrian has been very patient with her hand raised. So I'd like to give um, Adrian a, a chance to talk um, in a moment. I will just mention really quickly, um, there was just a chat um, coming in on Matt's view about who should read this book. And Matt can say more about that eventually, but I should actually comment that um, one of the things I really like about the book is that it's structured in a very creative way so that different people can read the book in different levels of depth. So if you're a philosopher and really want to get into the details about how this connects up with other philosophical work on science and values, you can kind of read the sections that go into the nitty gritty. And if you're more of a you know, a scientist or a student who could care less about the detailed philosophy, you can go through portions of the book that way. So um, it really is clever um, the way Matt put it together in that regard. But anyway, let's go ahead and uh, Matt may say more about that eventually, but um, I think Adrian has been very patient. Um, so go ahead. 
hi Matt and all like congratulations on the book it's I'm really I'm really looking forward to reading it this question is sort of an invitation for you to tell me a little bit more about what's going on with the moral imagination so I take it that the contingency argument goes a little bit like it turns out that what scientists do and their results are not absolutely determined they have to make decisions about what they do when they do science right and so you might think that scientists often make judgments using what you might think of as an epistemic imagination what kinds of scientific research should i pursue and so one way of i take it understanding this kind of move is to say well when i'm making those kinds of judgments about pursuit what science should i be doing or shouldn't i be doing I also have to include, in addition to my epistemic imagination, my moral imagination. I have to imagine what the consequences, the upshots, the sort of, you know, moral consequences of the science might end up being. Um, is that the sort of right way of conceptualizing what you mean by moral imagination? Is it sort of just expanding the circle of pursuit? Um, or do you, or is there sort of something um, more particular going on? Is there something about this being moral as opposed to epistemic? Um, that makes a difference to how I should think about moral imagination in this context. So is it just a widening the circle or is there sort of richer detail to bring out than that? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Adrian. Um, good question. Uh, so, I mean, I, so the book is making that argument, right? That, that um, we, need to, we need to widen that circle of considerations. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not gonna be a, a surprise um, to you to hear that um, the sort of linking is the linking factor is the way in which the actual decisions that scientists make, um, you know, have implications and consequences for the various kinds of values that we um, that we have, including not only epistemic, but also moral. Um, but the reference to moral imagination in the book is uh, is also a reference to a particular way of thinking about practical ethics um, that emphasizes the roles of, um, on the one hand, empathy, on the other hand, um, creative problem solving. Um, oh no, and a third hand. You can't have three hands. Okay. Well, anyway, on the third hand. Um, the importance of um, the, the sort of what Dewey calls the dramatic rehearsal of possible options, sort of a, a, a thinking through the consequences of adopting different um, uh, values uh, and different solutions um, to your uh, to your to your whatever question you're trying to solve. So the moral imagination also refers to that specific um, kind of of way of thinking through values or ethical problems. Fantastic. Um, so then we have a question from Farah um, in the chat, and I could read the um, uh, question, but uh, if they wanted to, um, we could unmute uh, Farah and uh, they could uh, go ahead um, themselves. Maybe just for the sake of time, so feel free to inter interrupt me, Farah, if, you're, if you get unmuted. But um, I'll just mention the question in the chat is, what is the role of empathy in the scientific imagination? Um, specifically on page 167, Matt claims that affective empathy is clearly reactive, but cognitive empathy clearly requires the exercise of imagination. So um, that's the question in the chat. If you just wanted to say anything more about um, your view on how empathy plays into this imagination. Sure. Uh, just just briefly, I mean, empathy um, plays a role insofar as it's crucial to um, take in, into account um, the stakeholders and their interests, right? So um, uh, that may be, you know, a question of how you engage with actual stakeholders, or maybe it's a it's a question of imagining the position that stakeholders um, have because you know, you're not addressing a, a, a significant enough question that a whole stakeholder consultation process is appropriate. Um, I do distinguish in the book between cognitive empathy and um, and uh, emotional or affective empathy. Um, there's a whole um, literature on sort of moral emotions um, 
and uh, the role of empathy, which points out some of the difficulties in relying on effective empathy. Um, but those problems don't really apply to the to the notion of cognitive empathy, which is which is um, basically not so emotion. Effective empathy requires that you feel what the other person feels, right? Um, Good in relationships, but bad for your surgeon, right? To have that kind of empathy. Uh, but um, uh, cognitive empathy requires you to understand, in in my sense, the the values or the interests of the of the of the other person, and that I just I think it does play an important role. Great, thanks, man. Oh, I'd like to see we're. At about 349, but these are such good questions. And I think people are really having fun interacting with you. So um, I don't think that, you know, we, those in charge need to say a whole lot at the end. So I'd like to see if we could maybe sneak in at least three more questions. Um, in the lineup I've got at present, um, there's Chase and Sunshine, and then I think David um, has their hand uh, raised. So maybe we can at least see if we can efficiently get through those three in the next 10 minutes uh, and see how things go. So, so Chase, um, did you want to, uh, maybe we could unmute Chase and let Chase get their question. Yeah, um, so I guess the general question is, um, so I've, I've kind of been digging into Dewey recently and especially on like his stuff on education. And I guess I'm just interested kind of to go along with the this question on STEM undergrad education. If this ideal shifts our approach to like public, you know, school education in terms of how the general public becomes engaged in science. Um, so like does the moral imagination ideal reframe how we, we go about teaching elementary and high school students science? A good question, Chase. Thank you. Um, uh, I th I think it does. Uh, in short, uh, I'm one of the reasons that um, I sort of gave the book the funny structure that Kevin described earlier, where there's sort of a pathway you can read where you can read the main argument of the book without engaging in a lot of the technical details between philosophers of science. Is that I did want you know um, maybe not uh k-12 or undergrad well maybe not take k-12 school kids to read the book that seems like a bit much but um i did hope that it could have an influence on science educators um and be of interest to science educators um and so i i do um i do think that recognizing that values play an essential role in science is an important thing for um, for everyone to understand, for the public to understand. Yes. Great. Nice job keeping things efficient, you two. Um, so uh, then uh, Sunshine uh, has a question in the chat, but again, if you'd like to get unmuted, it might be more fun to get to let you uh, raise this yourself about um, a vision of consultants. Um, can we? Putting together, and you can let us know, Sunshine, if I slaughter this. But you know, the idea is: um, does this ideal open up roles for philosophers of ethics or values to operate as consultants on these kinds of projects, and, and what that might look like in terms of individuals or groups or different kinds of structures? For this so hopefully that does some justice to what you are after, Sunshine. So one of the things. Um... That's an influence on uh, the account I give in the book um, is work by um, uh, a researcher named Eric Fisher and his collaborators, um, uh, and it's called socio-technical integration research, and it's it's basically a protocol for scientists, humanists, or sorry, philosophers, humanists, social scientists going into the lab as a kind of embedded. Um, you know, gadfly uh, effectively uh, to ask a lot of impertinent questions about um, why they're doing what they're doing and what their options are and what the sort of um, in slightly different language, but what I would call the, you know, the values considerations and stakeholder considerations that are relevant to what they're doing. Um, so I think there's a model there. Um, 
for embedding of so i would i would say less you know less a job for like a team of philosophers working together as philosophers being embedded on teams of scientists or engineers um in order to help you know um sort of break up habit and keep sort of the eye on contingency and and help sort of work through um the contingencies in a way that sort of lives up to the ideal of moral imagination. Great. Um, so I'd like to see if we could sneak in. I think David has had their uh, hand up for a bit. So maybe we could sneak in David's question. And uh, depending on how efficiently you can address that, there was just one last quick um, additional question that came up in the chat. I'm Maybe I'm a bad moderator. I'm tempted to try to get in as much as possible here. So anyway, let's go with David and we'll see how things go. Okay, thank you very much. Again, um, I was thinking about this, that it, it, it's not the discussion parallels some of the work that I do. I mean, my interest is the relationship between science and technology. And it seems like my, what you're doing is relationship between science and philosophy. And in in my field, several years ago, a man named Hugh, Hugh Aiken argued that what you needed to have were so-called translators. Again, maybe this is kind of supporting the polymath idea that uh, for that science and technology were different communities and they actually spoke different languages, almost in a Wittgensteinian sense. And, and that therefore you needed translators and translators needed to be people that were bilingual. Uh, now, I don't know that, but Reiner has a great deal to say about that tr translation is not simple. It's not just, you know, a book, getting a dictionary and going from one word to another. That translation actually involves a kind of total recreation of the original uh, book into a you know another language, and so I'm wondering whether you know again connect just putting philosophers in next door or in the same hallway with some scientists. It's like putting some German speaking people in a in a hallway with a bunch of English speaking people and hope they're going to have something to say to one another and that. In, in in my own field, what what arose was something called engineering science, which was called it was the the science of the application of science to technology. And I'm wondering, you know, is there a role to kind of develop a philosophy, not a philosophy of science, but a philosophy of the application of philosophy to science and whether that might be one way to bring these areas together. So I will stop. Thanks, David. Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, it, and it reminds me actually of um, the sort of uh, ideas that were swirling around um, the uh, International Encyclopedia of Unified Science project in the 1930s. Um, so uh, Otto Neurath in particular thought the sort of the job for philosophers of science was to act as that kind of like go between sort of um, uh, bet between different fields that had different languages and different methodologies and and kind of linking them up in, in much the same way that uh, you describe. And I, I don't know that he used the word translator, but I think that's similar to the idea that he had. Um, John Dewey in his article in the encyclopedia, uh, in his initial article in the encyclopedia on unified science as a social problem, um, adopted much that same idea, but said it was really liaison officers between science and society that were necessary, right? That's the job for philosophers of science, to, to sort of be the, the go-between between, between um, so, sort of social needs and values um, and, uh, and scientific work. Um, and, uh, so I think, you know, I think there definitely, you know, is, um, there's something to say there, uh, about a need to, um, 
I, I think there is a, you know, there is a role for philosophers of science to play here. Um, uh, absolutely. And I, 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 and the, and thinking about, I have not really thought about the framework of translation to describe it yet, but. Um, I'm going to play around with that. I think that's really interesting. So thank you for that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so it is one after four. So there have been some other things that have come up in the chat that people may want to think about. Um, I'm wondering, um, Matt, should I hand things back over to Magda and maybe wrap up? Uh, how do you feel about the time? Um, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to sneak one more in, but if anybody feels like they need to depart, you know, don't feel don't feel obligated to stick around. But it might be yeah, nice maybe to just take around. I, while we've got everybody here, it does seem like kind of a fun opportunity. Maybe I can just see, Magda, were there any, like, crucial things in case people do need to step away, um, crucial points that we should be letting people know? Um, and then maybe we could sneak another question or two in. Do, are there any other key announcements, Magda? I'll let her contemplate, and um, I'll go to this other question that Anne Marie um, uh, had. And maybe just um, really um, quickly, um, uh, I'll just um, sneak it in here. Um, Anne Marie was wondering whether you thought that the moral mat imagination um, would. Um, Actually, I just lost it. Um, but the basic idea was whether it would help or hinder um, innovation. So um, I don't know if you have thoughts on the relationship of moral imagination to innovation, um, how it might play out. Yeah, good, good question. Um, and uh, I, you know, I would say um, it it can potentially do both. Um, I think we tend to we tend to think about the hindering, right? So we tend to think about um, values in science as like closing off certain types of work. Um, research, you know, this is the scientists who complain about the interference of IRBs and research ethics. You know, this is what they're really worried about. Um, but part of the part of the example of the um, stem cell research case is meant to show that it's it really can also in, improve. It can also uh, help innovation, right? And that's an interesting case where it did a little bit of both, right? So, um, you know, the the long term ban on using embryos in research, and the and the and the more short term set of complicated restrictions created by the George W. Bush administration definitely like foreclosed on some research, right? That's that's you know you can't deny that. Um, whether that was appropriate or not is depends on whether you think the value judgments were correct or not, I guess. But um, um, but also, you know, it did push people to think about uh, adult stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, and that work has a lot of benefits that the embryonic stem cell research wouldn't have had, right? Um, in terms of easier uh, transplantability of tissues and some other other properties. I'm not an expert on this exactly, but um, but but uh, that's a lot of people have written about 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 these things. And um, it seems to be pretty much a consensus on it. Um, cool. So, you know, that's a case in which definitely like innovation was spurred, right? By the exercise of these actually very restrictive value judgments. So I would say it's it's always a case of 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 a little bit of both, right? Um, you know, it's gonna it's definitely gonna shape innovation. Um, uh, yeah. And so there's another question I would love to get to from Ian, but Magda, I think you unmuted a moment ago. Did, are there any sort of crucial things um, in case other people need to step away that you wanted to to be sure to announce? Yes, hi. I had some issues with unmuting myself. I'm sorry about that. So, um, a reminder: the link to a free download of the book is in the chat. So that's the reminder number one. Number two: this session is recorded, and um, if you uh, bear with me, because I would have to edit it a little bit, uh, then it will be posted on the Center for Values YouTube channel. And we will post announcements about that on our website and on our Facebook as well. So look forward to it. 
And um, Matt, I had an idea if you could share the link to the book's website so people can start leaving you comments there. Because as soon as we um, uh, end this meeting, I don't think I will have access to the chat and there are some really great ideas and great comments posted and it will be a waste for them to just vanish in thin air. So uh, please, uh, if you would like the discussion to continue, make sure that you visit the book's website and make sure that you leave um, the com your comments or questions there. Cool, thank you so much. Um, so um, yeah, really fun question in, in the chat. Um, basically asking um, on your account, can a sufficiently good moral imagination about the effects that there will be on stakeholders and their interests, can that moral imagination stand in place of stakeholder participation? Or does that stakeholder participation have its own good other than just ensuring the visibility and the moral imagination of those considerations? So I think that's a really interesting question about how we should think about you know, the involvement of stakeholders versus the scientist's moral imagination. Would you like to say anything about that? So it's sort of like, um, you know, imagine the ideal moral imaginer um, uh, who can, you know, get their the stakeholder interests right every time. You know, do we need to bother in engaging the stakeholders? Um, I think, you know, I would say yes. There still is a value to stakeholder engagement. Um, I would point to. Sort of Dewey, John Dewey and Jane Adams comments on the value of, of democracy here, right? Um, uh, uh, democratic ends require democratic means. Um, you know, de definitely. I, I, so I, I think there's definitely a, a, a value, the separate value to stakeholder engagement um, beyond just accurately getting their uh, interests right. Um, you know, I, I, but the flip side of that is, um, there are also costs, right? To engaging stakeholders time, uh, effort and, and so on. And so, you know, 1 has to exercise 1's moral imagination. Over the question of whether to engage in a stakeholder. Consultation process in order to determine, you know, is, is it going to be worth it in the end? Right? For, for, for big questions. I think it's going to be often is going to be the case that it's 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 going to be positive, um, you know. But I'm also I also think the the ideal has to cover, you know, the scientist at the bench, trying to figure out, you know, how to do a pretty small thing, right? Do it one way or do it another, and and there, you know, you have to you have to um, to, to to delay to to delay that question. Would have more harm than good, right? No matter what you decided to do. So that's a pretty good place to stop, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. That's great. It's wonderful that everybody has been engaged. Clearly, you know, Matt's book is of, of great interest, and I think we're all going to have a lot of fun um, engaging it with it in the future. So hopefully, we can have more conversations. Um, hopefully, for some of us in person with Matt um, eventually. So. Uh, Thank you so much. And, uh, any other final uh, comments, Magda, before we wrap it up? No, I think a round of applause for sure. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for all of you who found time to join us today. It's a really, really pleasure to host you here at our um, first uh, virtual book launch. It seems like everything is first this uh, semester or since March anyway. Um, so uh, again, thank you so much for, for the wonderful questions and comments. And like I said before, this meeting is recorded. It will be um, uh, posted on the Center for Values YouTube. I will make sure to have announcements to you about that on our Facebook. So visit us often there and also visit us on our website where uh, the information about the recording uh, will be posted as well. So again, thank you very much to Matt. Congratulations on a great book. It's a success. And thank you, Kevin, for moderating the sessions. And you all have a wonderful uh, afternoon and a happy Thanksgiving to you all.
Thanks to everybody who came. It was really uh, lovely to see so many, uh, so many people there, so many friends and students and colleagues. So thank you so much um, and have a great weekend.